Hi everyone. Um, yes, I guess one of my main claims to fame is I'm the uh, first potato grower in Australia to have potato, silid, potato tomato silage detected on their property. Um, we, we grow about 150 acres of potatoes a year and uh, consequently it had a big effect on our income for a year. I'll just give you a little bit of an intro into what happened with tomato, tomato potato silage. I still get trouble saying that name, it caused me that grief. It, uh, it was detected in WA in about February 2016. Um, somebody just found it in a backyard garden in Perth. That was just, it was that simple. They brought it in, they did an analysis, and that's how it came back. Where it came from, nobody's really sure. But that it's there, it is. Uh, it was found on our property. As soon as they found it in Perth, they, the Department of Agriculture in, in WA decided we're going to find out where this thing is. So uh, one of the main worries for it was that it was going to get into our seed industry in, in WA. So they put out their little yellow sticky taps, traps that you've probably seen around the place everywhere. And, uh, but to start with, they concentrated on people who had seed potato crops, which I was one. And they, they also went down to Albany and, and Manjum up, which are places further south from us, uh, to see if they could find any there. About two weeks after they put the traps on my farm, they, uh, actually it was three weeks, because they collected them in two weeks, uh, and they came back the next week on a Friday and said, Daryl, we've detected it. And I knew I was in a bit of trouble because they parked the cars out the front of the gate and they didn't even come on the farm. <laughs> they, so I, I had a chat to them. It was pretty, pretty stressful. We, um, we delivered potatoes the very day before. They'd gone off to the market. Um, we had potatoes ready to deliver the next week and bookings to deliver those potatoes. Uh, as soon as they rolled in on the place, which was on a Friday afternoon, they said, well, no, you can't deliver them. They also said, uh, anything that's on this farm, you can't take off it. And on top of that, over the next three days, I had a pretty extensive spraying program, which uh, involved spraying the boundary, then spraying the crop. Um, that was their first program. Uh, just after that, about oh, 10 days, they did further investigation and decided, no, you, you need to do more spraying because we want to make sure... With the, at this stage, they were still trying, hoping to eradicate the pest from WA. So basically, my potato crop got nuked. There was nothing alive out there bar the potatoes uh, after two or three programs of spraying. Um, in that time, it was about three weeks, I think, before they actually released me from quarantine, which meant I could deliver potatoes again. Uh, and in that time, I think it was about 200 tonne, 180 tonne that I had consigned, which I wasn't able to deliver. Um, and then it took about another week once I was even released before they'd allow me to, before I could get back into the cycle of delivering potatoes. So at this stage, I'd had a month of nothing delivered, and, and it was in March. March in uh, Western Australia is pretty warm, and you can imagine potatoes for a fresh market deteriorate pretty quickly. There's a lot of irrigation to try and keep the quality of them up, but basically they just they fell away, and, and in the end they were, they were almost unsaleable. The other thing that I couldn't do at that time is on that, I have four, four small farms, or uh, total up about 1,100 acres, and they'd only quarantined the one farm because that was the only place that detected it. But I couldn't take anything away from there, which meant the seed that I'd bought in to keep planting crops, I wasn't allowed to take off that farm to the other farms to plant. So it was quite, a, it was quite disruptive, this whole thing. So um, not only that, the... The whole state, obviously, was we had tomato, potato, silid, and uh, which is to actually the potato plant. It's not really that disruptive, but it carries the CLSO 
bacteria, which is what causes zebra chip in processing potatoes, which is what everybody was more worried about. The actual psyllid is pro probably more detrimental to other crops, tamarillos, capsicum, all the solanaceous crops. So it's detected in the state. Basically, the border between West Australia and the rest of Australia was shut for anything that could possibly transport this psyllid across the border. So uh, capsicum, strawberries, even lettuce. There was a program that thinking, well, OK, this thing could hide in a lettuce leaf and might get across. So for a period of about two weeks, the whole state border was shut just about to any vegetable across the border. Uh, eventually, they adopted a procedure whereby they could uh, send these things across and involved a bit of washing, a bit of work. But, but so now, basically, the whole border is open, except for potatoes, because they, uh, they're still worried about the CLSO bacteria getting out of WA, which it hasn't been detected in yet. I just might add that. <laughs> so you think, OK, this is all pretty horrible. And it was. It was a pretty rough couple of weeks. But after it had finished, um, because WA had signed up to the uh, emergency plant pest response team, which is all these big words, a bit hard for farmers, I'm sorry. <laughs> so up, we signed up to that. I got uh, reimbursed the total cost of that spraying. So basically that was about $6,000. So they reimbursed me for that. The 180 tonne of potatoes, actually it was 180 plus the 60 that I couldn't get in again. They, I did manage to sell some of them. Um, and so they reimbursed me for the ones that I couldn't sell. Uh, the other effect of it all was uh, where the psyllid was detected in Perth, they'd probably been there for a little bit longer than a couple of days when they found them. So they're still trapping for these psyllids at the moment. Some of the traps in Perth are finding 200 psyllids on a trap. So a trap's about that big. The psyllid's not very big but there's, they're finding that number on them. Because where we were, and they think what happened, they, they think the way it got transported down was um, it was found in a nursery. The nurseries sent out the crops, you know, tomatoes, capsicums, and just domestic people, perhaps even farmers, have bought these tomatoes to plant in the backyard, and the psyllids have escaped off them and just gone through the local area. The, um, but the side effect of this is, along with me getting detected with this, I was the first one, but there were three or four others detected in our area as well. And each one of those growers got put with a quarantine notice as well. So they went out, they sprayed the crop, and as I say, the spray program, there was three chemicals all used at maximum rates, and basically it was to try and eradicate the pest. So pretty much if they were in that crop, they were killed. The other thing about it is, in March, in Busseldon, we're really Mediterranean. It's, if it's not under irrigation, it's dead. The, the, the paddocks are brown. There's nothing alive. Even in the bush, the small plants, the grass dies off. So there's nothing alive there. So probably if, there, if the pests were going to arrive anywhere, it would have been on those potato crops. Those crops are sprayed. So we've just individually, the department stopped testing after they found that the stuff was there. But... Uh, a couple of neighbours and myself thought, well, we'd like to know what's actually happening with this pest as it goes forward. So that was 2016 it was detected. Through the spring of 2016, right through to the end of autumn 2017. Yep. Um, we did some extensive testing. We had traps out in all our paddocks all over that period. And we found two possibles amongst that whole time. So basically, because of the extensive program of spraying that was forced upon us, we actually probably have reduced the burden in the area. So um, it, it may well have been well and truly worthwhile, as it turns out. At the moment, the, um, the state's done all the testing to try and prove that we don't have the CLSO bacteria there. 
Um, and that's, that's with you guys and the rest of Australia as to whether you agree with that. So, but the cost, the cost of the state of this one little bug was probably in the tens of millions of dollars in lost productivity. And, and nobody knows where it came from. The other, and, and what this is all about is perhaps a little bit about biosecurity. We, we've had a couple of instances, even on our farm, of biosecurity. And, and because of that, we've changed our practices a bit. Um, 15 years ago, we, got, we, we run a cattle and a sheep enterprise as well. 15 years ago, we got foot rot. Another thing that they eradicate in WA. So it took us a couple of years to try and prune it out. In the end, the only way we could get rid of it was to sell all the stock on the farm, leave the place barren for a couple of months and restock. Again, it's, it's expensive. Another $15,000 down the drain just, just re replacing stock. About three years later, we bought another mob of sheep, got it again. Same process. So, but now we're starting to learn. It takes us a little while in the West. We're a bit silly, but we, uh, we now ring the department before we purchase sheep, see if there's any history at all of foot rot in those, those animals. And because of that, since that for the last 15 years, we've had no reoccurrences. So you, you can protect yourself a little bit because basically what we've found is that there's quarantine offices at every airport and there's, they're in, in the ports, but really on your own farm, the person who's responsible for looking after your biosecurity is yourself. And if you don't do it, you can go and blame all the people. I mean, I could be angry at the whole world about having tomato potato salad, but, and there's probably nothing I could do about that one. But I do know that if I work with foot rot, I can actually save myself a great deal of expense myself. Uh, Another instance, while we are in quarantine, there's a state for tomato potato psyllid. We also had another nasty bacteria that called, hopefully I'll get this right, it's another one of those big words, Dickia dianthocola, I think it is. It's a really uh, bad form of black leg or fusarium and it causes rots in potatoes. Now, this is a story where basically Somebody made a mistake and he probably didn't realise it, but it, it had a bad effect. Again, he, he's a seed potato grower. He, he bought in... His daughter was getting married, so he thought he'd get all the flowers growing for his daughter's wedding. So he bought in some dahlia bulbs. Bought, didn't buy them from overseas, bought them from Victoria. They came over there. He planted the dahlia bulbs, harvested them, had them at his daughter's wedding. The next crop, he planted his seed potatoes there and then the seed potatoes got sold through the state. These potatoes had this infection from the gladiola bulbs that he brought in. So I didn't think about it. It's not one of those things you'd think is going to happen to you. You just think, oh, you know, they're just gladiola bulbs. They come from interstate. There's no big deal. He brought them in. That probably cost him $200,000 and it tarnished his name as a seed grower. Just through some little thing. So I guess if there's a message that I can give to you, and, and look, I got totally reimbursed through the emergency plant press response date. All my spraying costs, all the costs of potatoes was, was covered, only up to the point that was legitimate. You know, I couldn't fudge the figures or anything like that. There was a big survey. So I was lucky with that one. This guy... This was an exotic pest, so he didn't get a cent. He, he did that money just simply because of something that probably I would have done. He made a mistake. He brought some stuff in that he didn't think would be a problem for potatoes, and it made a hell of a mess for him. So I think if, if there's one message I can give, hopefully, is that if you're going to let something on your farm, Make sure you know where it's come from and you know that it's safe. I mean, I've, I've been farming for 30 odd years. 18 months ago, I got big signs made up. They're on my farm, on the gates that say, you want to come in this place, give me a ring. But don't go through the gate 
until they do. When I buy stuff now, I make sure it's coming from a reputable place. I mean, it can still happen, but at least you're giving yourself a chance. Make sure if you're going to bring something in to your place, it doesn't matter where it comes from, that you know, you know where it comes from because you're the ones that are going to get hurt. <laughs>